At this time, I would like to welcome all of you to our seminar uh, entitled The Evidence for Faith. Today's presentation is entitled Natural Health Solution. And without further ado, let us pray. O oh, dear Heavenly Father, we ask, dear Lord, that we may be open our minds and hearts to the message of health, dear Lord. For our health is very important to our spiritual growth. Dear Heavenly Father, we know from your word that you regard health a priority, dear Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, from the healing that you did in the New Testament, we know that there is great power in health. Health is a beautiful thing, dear Lord. I ask the Heavenly Father at this time that we may be open again, our hearts and minds totally to this special message in your word. In Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And now, um, Sister Tamara Grubb will lead out in song service. Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation. We'll start with number 187. Number 187. And we'll sing the first, second, and last stanzas, number 187. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, my Savior makes me whole. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength for weakness, let me hide myself in Him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, He my strength, my victory wins. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Last stanza. Jesus, I do now receive Him more than all in Him I find. He hath granted me forgiveness, I am His and He is mine. Alleluia, what a Savior, Alleluia, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me to the end. Our next hymn will be number 248. <clears throat> number 248. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me It tells me of a Savior's love Who died to set me free It tells me of his precious blood The sinner's perfect plea Oh, how I love Jesus 
Oh, how I love Jesus so. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. So, oh, how I love Jesus because He first loved me. Our opening hymn will be number 625. We'll be singing our theme song, number 625, Higher Ground. Please turn to number 625. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and I shall stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these are bound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has called the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven i found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and shall stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. At this time, we'll begin with a short word of prayer. And welcome again to our presentation this evening as we're looking at natural health principles. And we'll begin with a short word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for your love towards us and for the blessings of knowing the own true God. Thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings, dear Lord, of being able to study and understand the wisdom from that Bible. And the wisdom, dear Lord, to know the truth, dear Lord, that we can be set free and we can be held healthy and live happy lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our series of um, the evidence for faith. And we're looking at examples of faith that is in the Bible, examples of what is evident. 
And we start our presentation the same way we start every evening or every presentation. And we start by defining faith and showing that faith is not blind faith. That faith is not what we will call blind faith, a blind experience, a blind um, acceptance of what we're told, but that we're weighing evidence. And the evidence that we're weighing is as is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when we look at the word faith, we know that faith is something that is not tangible, just like your philosophy. The philosophy itself is not tangible, but there are principles or lessons or teachings that are existing. And this teaching is supposed to teach a person something about the realities of life. And so, faith is what we'll call something that is not tangible because it's a, it's a concept, it's an idea, it's an experience. But this experience, it's backed up by substance, as it said on the board, and it's also backed up by evidence. And so each of these presentations that we're doing, we're looking at the various different substance and the various different evidence to base our faith upon, that our faith is rock solid. Um, the next text that is important, as we have it here, is Romans chapter 10, 10, verse 13 through 17. As we had read before, I will not reread the whole thing, but we'll go to verse 17. Speaking about faith, speaking about how we come to faith through the, the word of God, through the preaching, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we believe that the, 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 the book that we'll use for our um, understanding of faith is the Bible, that the Bible explains faith, the Bible explains um, what we understand in this life and how we take those understanding, how we take what we see, what we experience, and we connect it or we compare it with the Bible. And as we compare it with the Bible, what we come away with is what we'll call faith, a faith in the divine, a faith in our creator God, and a faith in the things that he tells us to do, that when we do it, we receive the benefits and the blessings of that faith. And so, this is what we're here doing. And so tonight, our topic is natural health principles. We're looking at natural health principles in the Bible, that there's health in the Bible, the Bible addressed this issue. And that's something that's fascinating with the Bible, because the Bible, written how many thousands of years ago, has presented to us various health principles that are important, that are time-tested, they are true. And that these health principles, we ought to follow. When we follow, we receive the blessings that the health principles are espousing. And when we receive these blessings, what will simply happen to us is that we will confer or confirm what the Bible is saying, that it is a reliable word and it's established our faith. And so some of these health principles we're going to look at tonight. And we're going to try to get an understanding of what the Bible is teaching so that we can get the benefits of it. And as we get the benefits of it, it strengthens our faith or it's an evidence of faith and we base now that says because God says this we believe the word of God and we live and practice our life in in that way now the first question I wanted to ask is what are some general health guidelines when studying the Bible what are some general guidelines when studying the Bibles that we have and in relation to health now in Exodus chapter 20 chapter 15 verse 26 Exodus chapter 15 verse 26 it says here and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now here is a very important principle. And this principle here is saying that says, When you follow, diligently that means you follow it to an exaction you follow very rigorously very detail orientated the principles that the lord has says when it comes on to health what you'll find is that when you follow these principles that these principles will lead to better health and you will be able to avoid the diseases of the egyptians now we know the egyptians have many diseases which we will talk about some of them in this health presentation and some of them were madness various different type of heart problem di diabetes problem all type of venereal problems and these problems were what the, the the mummies when they test the mummies they realized that they had these diseases and so we're seeing uh, 
upsurge or increase in drug resistance every disease around us. And as we're seeing this, the question is, if we follow what the Bible says, can we avoid, can we prevent, and can we overcome some of these diseases? And the Bible, according to this text in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it would say, yes, we can avoid and overcome these diseases. And so this is one very important general guideline that what you do does affect your health. What you do does affect your health. And you can prove this by following the principles that are here. Now in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So again, we believe that says these principles that are in the Bible, some of them over 3,500 years, they are principles from the Lord. And again, because I can't see the Lord, and I, I've never heard the Lord talk to me verbally, but because I follow the principles and I test the principle out, and if the principles remain true, and when I follow the principle, I get the health benefit from the principle, the health benefit come to me and I become healthier, I heal my body, then I say, well, these principles, they must point to a God, and it makes me believe in God and make me have faith in God. Because he says, I am the Lord, and I, he says, I'm the Lord there, up there, and he says, he changed not. So because there's no change with the Lord, because the Lord is not going to go to the left or go to the right, we believe that says we can follow the Lord and we can have the blessings and the benefits that the Lord would have us to have. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, he says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. So Christ is saying here that says he came, you know, decades and centuries and millennia after the first writings of the Bible. And he says, I didn't come to destroy. Now many people say when Christ came and after he died, he destroyed the Old Testament. He destroyed the prophets. And so we don't have to pay attention to these health laws anymore because they're useless because Christ nailed them to the cross. And what you'll find is that says when you start to practice the health laws, you get the healing. So you have to ask yourself the question, wait a minute, if I get the healing and Christ says he didn't come to destroy, then probably Christ was right. And those who are saying that Christ destroyed these health principles, probably they're wrong. Verse 18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So we're still here. The heaven is not passed away. The hurt is still here. And so nothing in the law, primarily we talk about the law or the prophets. We're talking about the writings of Moses, the law, first five books of the Bible, and then all the prophets. Christ says none of those things are going to pass away. But people say, I thought Christ nailed the whole testament to the, to the, to the cross. Well, Christ says it will not pass away. So you're going to have to check your theology there and your biblical understanding. And so he says it will not pass away. So if there's a health principle in the Old Testament and it's there to bless us. If we practice that principle, we'll receive the blessing. And the blessing is sure because Christ is saying, look, I've not taken away the blessings. The blessing is dear. Just follow what I say and follow it, follow it diligently. Whosoever dear sure shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So right now, we believe that we're taking it by faith that as I stand here, and I'm presenting these things to you, that in heaven, my name is great. All right? And I'm claiming that promise. And verse 20 says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness, that's the right things you're doing. And remember, this is Jesus Christ speaking. He's saying, except your right doing, the way you practice the Old Testament, the way you practice the New Testament, teachings that were not nailed to the cross, not the ceremonial laws, but the precepts and principles in the Old Testament, you'll find that says, that's your right doing, because righteousness is right doing. It's doing the right thing. It says, for I say unto you, Jesus Christ speaking here now, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that's the religious false teachers out there in the world today, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so we believe that we claim these promises and know that the things we're going to be studying tonight, they are the best thing for us. So the best diet for humanity is found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 29. 
this is one of our first biblical principles that we come into contact with the moment we start reading the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29. And God says, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So here is what we call the Genesis 1 29 diet and this diet state that says a plant-based diet was the original diet given to man men were not created to eat plants but were primarily created to eat fruits number one then nuts seeds and later on as we're going to read a little bit more vegetables were given so original man was created he was only created to eat fruit as the sub as the title or the topic of the main thing that he eat but below that you would break down fruit as in seeds, nuts, grains, fruits itself. Because anything that the plant bear of its own and it has seeds in it, that would be food for humanity. And the primary food for humanity was what come off the tree. And the tree would bear primarily uh, fruits, mango, orange, banana, so forth. That was man's original diet in the Garden of Eden. And we find that the closer we follow the Genesis 129 diet, which is a plant-based high fruit diet, we find that your healing will come rapidly. The higher amount of fruits you eat is the more healthy your body will be. And so here, God says, Genesis 1 to the 9 says, He given us these things to eat, and if we follow it, we'll receive the blessing. Now, after sin, after the fall of man, we find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, is outlined the secondary food that was given to us after sin. And it says, Thorns also, thorns also and thistle shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now here, after man's sin, because disease and ill had set in after man had eaten the poisonous fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God says, I was going to give to you now herbs. And we find that later on that it says herb is for the healing of the nation. Herb is for the service of the animals and herb has healing in it. And when we think about it in today's language, in today's world, and we look in today's world, your primary source of healing is going to come from herb. Now, 3,500 years ago, Moses said, that says, the thing you need for healing is herb. Fruits is good for cleansing and nourishment, but it doesn't deal with disease as herbs deal with disease. The, the, the roots of the plants, the bark of the plants, the leaf of the plants. And that became part of the diet of humanity. And we find that says the best diet for humanity is fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, and seeds. And when you partake of that, you find that your healing comes rapidly. And that's the best diet for us. We continue here. That was our first principle. So the first principle of health is that we have a plant-based diet. And this diet is a diet that is good for us. Second principle that we want to look at here, second principle we want to look at here is um, disease has root cause. There's root cause to disease. Disease doesn't come by chance or disease doesn't come by accident. There's a root cause to disease. And many people believe that says their disease that they're experiencing is just by chance. But the Bible teaches a very important health principle. And that health principle is that says disease doesn't come by chance or by accident. And here we have it in Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Now, when we think about diseases, when we think about health, we think about curses. It's a curse. It's a plague. It's a pestilence. It's, it's something that is killing people and it's causing destruction of the body, destruction of the health, the nervous system, the brain. All of these d destruction is going on in the person's experience. So as the person's experience, the person says, I'm cursed. But yet the Bible gives this one basic and important principle that the curse causeless does not come. Now, can we test this principle? Yes, we can test this principle in our daily lives. And how we test this principle in daily life is that says whatever disease a person is having, there's a cause for it. There's a root cause. Now, somebody said, what if they were born that way? Then there's a root cause. An example of that would be blindness caused by gonorrhea. Right? There's a root cause. So the person born that way, but there's a root cause. How about diabetes? There's a root cause. It's a diet and lifestyle. 
How about high blood pressure, the diet and lifestyle? How about mental health problem, diet and lifestyle? How about um, nervous problem, diet and lifestyle? There's always a root cause. Somebody says, I'm dying because I have cirrhosis of the liver. My liver is falling apart. Well, do you drink alcohol? Somebody says, I'm having pancreatic cancer. Do you drink coffee around the clock? Somebody says, I'm having some lung problem. Do you smoke? The, the curse doesn't come without a cause. And for many years, people have thought that says, um, it was some of the things that's causing people to die of lung cancer. Why, for many years, many people in the natural world were saying it's because of smoking. You smoke the thing and it destroys your lung. So the curse doesn't come causeless. So anytime you're sick, think about this health principle. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. Think about it and says, look, why is it I'm sick? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I drinking enough water? Am I exercising? What is my experience? What is my diet and lifestyle like? And quickly you will find out that says the curse comes with not without a cause. There's always a cause to the curse. Whatever person says, I have a mental health problem. I'll say again, the curse comes not causes. But somebody said, well, you know, I, I, I believe in the Bible. I serve the Lord. I, I don't think about evil thoughts, but my brain is weak. What's your diet like? What's the diet of your parents like? What are you putting inside of your body that will destroy the mind? Because a curse doesn't come without a cause. And this is the story of Genesis and the fall of men. That says everything that happened to man, there was a root cause to it. The curse comes at causeless. So that's a very important health principle. Is that when we follow this health principle in the Bible, we find that says we'll be able to deal with all of our health problems. And next principle here I want to go at and look at is dangers of high fat diet. And we find that in a high fat diet, you have diseases that are exacerbated by the high fat diet. And so again, anything that puts strain on the body, the curse comes not causeless. Because any strain in the body will damage the body. And so AIDS, hepatitis, um, and other diseases caused by coming into contact with blood. So normally when we talk about a high fat diet, we're talking about eating things like um, beef, pork, and so forth. Chicken, even fish. The person is consuming a lot of flesh, and with that flesh comes a lot of cholesterol, comes a lot of fat. And in that diet, you find that says the diseases that are transmitted to the human beings are most of the time coming from contact with animals. Now, somebody said to me, say, Lord, you see the dangers of a high-fat diet, which is normally connected with animals, why would you put on the board AIDS? Well, we know that says AIDS came from the, 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 the chimps, from the, 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 the chimpanzees that they were experimenting with in the labs. And chimps have a version of AIDS. It's just called CIV. But here we call it, we call it HIV. And because it's a human version of the chimp disease. And the, the chimpanzees, they have the disease. And what they were doing, they were growing various different vaccines on the liver of these chimps to be able to give it to human beings. And they believe that they didn't purify it enough and transfer it via labs into the human population. Or secondary, many people believe that's because people in certain African countries eat the brains of these chimps and eat the various different parts of these chimps as exotic foods or succulent foods, foods that are not supposed to be eaten. They end up um, carrying carriers of the disease. Another example of this would be Ebola. Recently, there was an outbreak of Ebola, and what the government in Africa had to do was ban the eating of bats because the bats were carriers of the Ebola virus. And so many people were dying of Ebola. And so what, what simple way to do it is to deal with the animal diet. And the animal diet is not only dangerous for disease, but it's dangerous for fat. And we find the second L principle listed here in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 23 through 27. And it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Ye shall eat no manner of fat, of ox, or of sheep, or of goat. Now, why would the Old Testament say a principle like this? It is simply that says pesticides and all different type of chemicals and fat itself, fat, when it goes inside of your mouth, it goes into the body as fat and it stays as fat. And it clogs the system. Plus, fat carry all the waste matter and, can, and hold the waste matter in the body. Toxic chemicals, pesticide residue, everything is holding fat. And you can check the EPA website and they will say, that says if you're going to eat anything with fat that is animal fat, you need to basically get rid of the fat because the fat contains the highest concentrations 
of pesticide and toxic or heavy metals. And so again, 3,500 years ago, Moses says, no fat. Remove the fat from your diet. Somebody says, what Moses is talking about, the fat is the best part of the food. Well, here we go, how many thousand years later, we find that says, even, even the fat of plants become problematic when it comes down to pesticide. A high fat diet period is problematic. And so Moses was right. And somebody said, well, that's 3,500 years ago. But now we have the science to prove that he was right. So the question then for your faith is, how would Moses know this? He didn't have a microscope. He wasn't able to go and do any type of scan of the arteries or anywhere in the body, arteries in the body, and say, oh, the, the, the more fat a person eats, the more clogged they are. Moses just simply say, get rid of the fat. Keep reading here, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 24 through 27. And of the fat of the beast that died of itself, and the fat of that which is torn with beasts may be used in any other use, but ye shall in no wise eat it. You can use it for something else, but you can't eat it. For whatsoever eat it, for whosoever eat it, the fat of the beast, of which men offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, even the soul that eateth it, it shall be cut off from his people. And I believe this cut off is in not only a spiritual sense, because we have done, they have done many exam experiments with animals, and they have shown that animals that gorge themselves on fat become dumber and dumber. And you become so dumb that you get cut off. And they just cut you off and put you in a mental ward because your brain is not working because it's clogged with fat. Check it out and you'll find that that is scientific. Moreover, the person's brain becomes so clogged that they can't understand anything that's too deep. It's better for them to just sit in front of a television and just look like they're zombies because of the amount of fat they're gorging themselves off of and they become just dumb enough to watch TVs and stuff like that. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwelling. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Now somebody saying, what's going on here? Well, what we know going on here is that the blood is where we, um, we cont where con what con the blood is where um, diseases are contained in the body. And it's where the, the body transmits disease from one person to the other person. So when you're eating food and it's filled with blood, most people like their meat rare, where the blood is hosing out of it. They're eating the disease of the animals. And when they can't eat that disease, they become diseased themselves. So the question is, where is now the why is there such an increase with drug-resistant diseases? Simply because the animals are given all these drugs, they, the diseases become drug-resistant in their body, and then they turn around after they get the, the drug-resistant. Now the blood and all the fat and everything is eaten by the human beings. They eat it, and then they receive the disease in their self. And so that's why so much of our population is filled with cancer and filled with all these different diseases. And they keep running and running to see if they can raise money to do more cancer research. While if they would just simply follow this principle, and this principle up here where Moses taught, up, taught us over 3,000 something years ago, it would simply be they would get rid of the cancer. Because the cancers, except the ones that are coming from toxic chemicals, are primarily being eaten from the cancerous meat and the cancerous blood that they're consuming from day to day. And so this is solidly proven by science, and this is here in the Bible. So somebody said, hmm, how could Moses know this? And we believe because Moses, as he said, he said, I receive it from the Lord, and I gave it to you, and you can receive the blessing if you would just follow and believe and have faith. We continue with another health principle. Religious leaders should be an example, especially pertaining to worship. Now, why the Lord did this, and this is very important because you find somebody said, well, Lord, you're speaking about some principles that are health, that are found in the Bible. Why my religious leader doesn't teach these principles? Why these religious principles are not taught by my religious leader? The answer would be, is I said, the Lord had required that religious leaders in Israel were supposed to practice these principles to teach the people because remember all of this is an act of faith and you find that it's very difficult for, to, for individuals or people to keep to a health law or healthy diet without um, faith without the religious teaching because it's connected because remember the fall of humanity happened around food and the continuation of the fall of humanity still happened around food and so here the religious teachers were supposed to connect the natural life 
with the spiritual life and to teach the member, members and their, 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 their members and their congregants that the spiritual is connected with the physical. And that if you are failing on life and feeling that like your spiritual is a big problem because you're failing at your daily life. And that the evils that often overcome in you is by practice. I'll read it for you so you can get where I'm going. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8 and 9, it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy son with thee. When ye go into the ta tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations. So here, it was told um, the, that the, the, the lifestyle and the practice of the Levi was supposed to be above the people. They were supposed to give an example to people of what a sober life is. Now let's imagine that you have a priest who is supposed to be talking about high principles, high morals, high lifestyle, but yet their practice is low. They will encourage the members that they're supposed to be encouraging to live a low life. So we're told that says, no, you don't encourage people to live a low life, you encourage them to come up a bit higher. And so the priest was expected to practice these principles we're talking about and to teach them. And we find when this is not happening, the society becomes more immoral, the society becomes more drunken, and the society practices these things that they ought not to. Somebody needs to be encouraging somebody um, to live moral lives. What, what do you think about that? Now, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, again, why this is so important? That we find here that says, it says that anybody that takes drugs or alcohol, right here is talking about drugs, I'm, I'm sorry, about alcohol, is deceived by it. So you go to somebody and say, oh, no, it's, it's okay to drink alcohol. They're deceived. It's just, there's no, no different conversation to have. A person who believes that alcohol is, should be consumed is just deceived. They're foolish. Because, it, again, it's a mocker and it's raging. What does it mean, raging? It means you cause you to be getting into wrath and anger and strife and fighting and debate. debate. And you're debating and you're doing all of this because you have alcohol in your system. You're under the influence, and it's not a positive influence, it's a satanic influence. And so we find in the Bible, the Bible has a very negative view of wine. But yet we find in the Bible, sometimes the Bible says that God's people drink wine. And so people always say, why the Bible contradict itself? And simply because we know there's two types of wine. There's wine that is fermented and one that is unfermented. We believe here it's talking about the fermented wine, the one that is the grape that is fermented, that it caused somebody to be raging and to have anger and to be and to be a mockery none of you and anybody ever can say they drink just your regular grape juice and got angry or got raging so obviously context is that the whatever cause to be rage must be the alcohol okay and if you know any difference you can tell me so it's important for you to be taught this and for you to understand that this is something you need to be encouraged to do Getting back to disease trans transmission, um, we find that in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, here is another very important principle that is taught in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32 says, But whosoever committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own what? Soul. Now remember, it destroys his being. He destroyed his soul because, again, a person does not have the understanding. When you become married to a person, you become one. And you start to share each other's diseases. And as you share each other's diseases, it's better to contain both of your diseases to each other. And do not pass it on to anybody else. And so that's why it's best that says, with human being, and it's best with every human being, that is one husband and it's one what? Wife. And the two of them can contain their disease amongst each other. And don't start to pass it amongst other people. And so the Bible says a person who gets into a, a relationship now where there's a third person involved, person is not wise. They don't know that they're destroying their own soul. Now are we seeing this? Well, we've seen this, but it's light now. But now we're having more and more the development of drug-resistant STDs. And now we're going to really see that when they're going to get these STDs because they refuse to stay with the one wife, one husband principle, that they're going to run to the hospital and the hospital is going to leave because you're going to infect the rest of us. Because we can't help you. So again, is this an Old Testament biblical principle? Is this something that we can see and says, 
how did the Bible get it right again? And as I said, we have so much we can go over. There's so much that we're going to be going over in the next coming nights as you keep coming out and keep hearing this presentation. Next presentation we're doing is Tuesday night. We're talking about creation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, it says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. Sinned against his own body. How can you sin against your own body? You're hurting your own self. The sin that you're doing is affecting you. Verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the what? A temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. So the way we treat our bodies will reduce disease transmission. And this was known in the olden time. And there's no answer for it. There's no answer for it. Many people believe that says even through a condom, I don't know if I need to edit this out, but even through a condom that you can get AIDS. Some people believe this. Some people argue that. And probably if you ever read the box, they will say that in there. So transmission of disease, especially we're talking about sexual transmitted disease, is something that there's no solution for but to stick to, oops, just but to stick to one wife, and one husband. Probably need to cut that out. Keep going. Disease transmission again. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19 through 25. Also, thou shalt not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is put apart for her what? Uncleanness. Now, this principle, I remember I was talking to somebody, and they said to me, said, Lloyd, the Old Testament is near to the cross. So I say, I'm going to ask you one question. There's a principle in the Old Testament. that's found in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19. That says that you should not have sexual relationship with a woman when she's having her period. I said, did Christ nail that rule to the cross? And now is it okay for a man to have sexual relationship with a woman that is having her period? He says, I need to get back to you. And I never heard back from him again. That was it. Because what we find is that says the principles in the Old Testament, though there might be old principles, you'll be healthier for it. You'll be healthier if you follow them. And then the question you have to ask is how somebody with no scientific background just claiming that the Lord told him. And he write it down and say, follow it. And you follow it, you get the benefit. How could he do that? How is that possible? And the answer is simply because this is an evidence of our faith because it's impossible. Verse 20 says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. Right? Thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. That was a principle that we just read a, a while ago. Because it pulls down and stops disease transmission. So you want to be healthier? One husband, what? One wife. To defile her, to defile thyself with her. Is that similar to the language of, of Solomon that wrote? Now how did Solomon know that? How could he in Proverbs write that says it's not good to sleep with all these different women? How did he know that? He had how many wives? 700 and something wives plus concubines? Could he have proven that principle? And when he wrote, he said, you know, I better write this down. I better tell everybody. One husband, one wife. Amen. 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 He proved it. And I think he probably ended up with a lot of diseases. Now, um, verse 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Now, this is one of the abominations the Bible talks about, that we have now accepted it as something that is um, free and accepted. But here, the Bible says, thou shalt not do it. Now, we find, um, as of a week ago or two weeks ago, New York Times, Times.com, Times .com, put out an article, and they were saying that says, syphilis is on the rise in America again, and that 91% of all the syphilis cases are men. And primarily, the, the largest percentage of those men that are having syphilis are actually homosexual men because they're growing and they're incubating that, that syphilis in their um, nether parts or nether parts, and this is causing a rise in syphilis among the homosexual men. But the Bible said this is not right. And many people who are pro-homosexuality or um, practicing homosexuals, they always point to this, this text and they're upset with this text because they're upset that Moses says that you shouldn't do it. And they think this text is wrong, and this text is hateful and wrong. But at the end of the day, the disease transmission, all these um, in, in areas in Greenwich Village and areas in San Francisco and those areas, they have high numbers of men that are having flesh-eating bacteria in their groin area, in the lower areas in their body, because of all the filth that they're 
messing about with. And at that point, what happened is that we go back to this text, and this text says it's an abomination, it shouldn't be done. Now, people say it's wrong, but this I say is an evidence of our faith. Science have not really proven this text to be wrong. It is scientifically accurate or health accurate, because we're talking about health here, that this cause abomination. You should not, I'll read it one more time for you. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. It should not be done. And when you practice this, you find that your health will be better and you'll be able to avoid flesh-eating bacteria in the groin area and syphilis and all these other drug-resistant diseases that are becoming more and more prevalent amongst the openly practicing or the closet practicing homosexuals. Now, verse 23 continues, says, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Why is it confusion? Because we're not supposed to have those type of relationship with animals. Now, I know we're in a place in time where people now become very close to animals and they see animals as one of the, their, their children. And they believe that they, they should lay into the bed with their um, animals. I am a problem with that too. Not just lay in bed with your, um, with your animals, but lay in bed with your children. And we find that in America, we're having a major problem and around the world with incest. And so this, we believe that there needs to be boundaries set up. And all the Lord is doing simply here is just set up that here's a boundary, here's a boundary, here's another boundary, and there's another boundary. And when you practice these boundaries, you'll be healthier for it. Now, in verse 24, it says, Defile not yourself with any of these things. For in all these, the nations are defiled, which I cast out before thee. Now, I want to explain this to you because this is important for understanding. The nations that were before Israel were cast out because they were openly practicing all these things that we have to say, that we had just talked about. Sleeping with animals, which is called bestiality. Should not lay down with a beast. And they were sleeping with animals on a regular basis. And the Lord says, I have to destroy you. Now we find that many diseases, even STDs, are happening because of this. Because there's a high prevalence now of people sleeping with animals. And this is causing a rise in diseases. And the Bible says this is an abomination. It should not be. And it's confusion that you're practicing. Because we are a different creation from the animals themselves. And yet in verse 25 it says, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity there, thereof upon, upon it. And the land itself vomit out her inhabitants. So again, we're seeing the increase in diseases. We're seeing increases in disasters. And we point that says these things, the inhabitants that are sleeping with animals and sleeping with mankind as they sleep with womankind are getting the just punishment that they're working for. And so for your health, it's better to stay away from these abominable practices. It will increase your health and make you healthier. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Uh, this word cleave here is hold your wife tight and don't let her go. And they shall become what? One flesh. Now, the Bible doesn't say they shall become one spirit. The Bible doesn't say they shall become one soul. The Bible says they could become one what? Flesh. And we understand that that's not only in, it's not primarily even to do with the thinking. They have committed to being one with each other, but it also has to do with what we're talking about with, with sexual relationships. It becomes one flesh. You become a partner with a person, and it's a partnership for life. We believe this is what the Lord ordained, and we believe that this is the way we should practice it. One man and one woman for life. Amen. Emotional health. <laughs> Emotional health. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 28 and 29. And it says here, The Lord shall smite thee with, the, with madness and with blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy way. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. Now you look at this principle, you say, hmm, emotional health. What are we having a problem with? An epidemic with health and a mental health problem. So much of our society has to always be on some type of illicit drugs, crack cocaine, marijuana, heroin, something to feel good about life. Or on some psychotro psychotropic medication or on some painkiller or something to let them feel good. A large percentage of society, when I say a large percent, it seems like more and more is becoming probably if one out of every two person you meet is on some mental health drug or some legal or illegal drugs. Now, why is that important? Because one of the things you find that is an increasing problem is this idea here, not often just mind blindness and madness, 
but astonishment of heart. Somebody say, Lord, we mean astonishment of heart. Somebody's having a panic attack. Person is healthy, to look healthy, to look big and strong, and every time there's a shooting, they run out and buy more guns. But they have 30 guns at home. Now, how you have 30 guns at home, you need another one. Because somebody just got shot. So they buy more. And they're panicking and they're worried because somebody's coming to take what they have. And they'll be sitting down, calm, nothing is happening, and all of a sudden, start panic. And this has been on the increase. And why it is happening, because people now are, don't believe that there's a God, they're living a wicked life, they're treating their bodies as if their body's not healthy, and their mind is getting destroyed because of it. Because the Bible says this is what will happen when people become rebellious. So somebody said, Lord, why would that be an evidence of faith? Because I'm seeing it around me. And the Bible diagnoses it, it tells you what's going to happen, and as a society become more ungodly, become more unfriendly, become more hateful, they become more paranoid. And every shadow they see, they shoot at the shadow. Until what they do sooner or later, take the mental drugs, and then they go and shoot up all their family members, or shoot up a school, or shoot up something. And we find that all the mass murders that happened in the last 10 years, almost all of them were on psychotropic medication because their brains have gone cuckoo, crazy. And they go and take the drugs, and under the influence of the drugs, and under the influence many people believe of demons because if you hear the microwave tell you to go and kill somebody, you go and kill somebody. It's possible because the demons are controlling you. And so we find that the Bible says this is what will happen. And we're seeing it. And this to me is an evidence of faith. I believe more in God because I say, wow, God says this is what will happen to them. And is the society immoral? Yes. Is the society I hate God? Yes. And how are they doing? Terrible. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 13 says, a merry heart, a merry heart make it a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is what? Broken. Many people, as I say, by the time we reach 35, you can see not only the spirit is broken, but the face is broken. And they look so sad and in despair. Because life has beaten them and beaten them because they're trying to do things outside of what the Bible says to do it and it's not working. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 says, A merry heart do a good like a medicine. But a broken spirit dried up the what? The bones. And we know the bones is where the bone, the marrow is, is and where the blood is produced. And we find that a person become unhealthy and also their spirit become broken. And when your spirit become broken, it's just total depression and there's no help for you. Proverbs chapter 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. Have peace in one's soul. This is what the Bible is saying. These are principles if you follow, you find that you will be blessed and blessed forevermore. And when you follow them, you say, well, wait a minute. I follow it and I'm blessed. Hmm. Could it be that the Bible is inspired? And could it be that there's something to this book that needs for me to pay attention to? And probably I should worship a God that I cannot see. It probably will bless my soul and I won't be so depressed and murderous. Proverbs chapter 30, chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long, long life and peace shall they add to you do you want peace in your soul well you follow the words of the lord and you'll have that peace um gluttony is another problem that we're seeing and the bible says here be not proverbs chapter 23 verse 20 proverbs chapter 23 verse 20 um it says be not among wine bibbers among writers eaters of flesh for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with what? Rags. Laziness, overeating, is becoming a sport of fools in our society. Becoming a sport for people who do not care about their bodies, that they'll eat themselves into diseases. And the Bible says this is a problem. And so then we believe in temperance, we believe in avoiding alcohol, and we believe that says you have self-control. And when you have this self-control, you find that simply your life would be much better. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 18 says, If a man have a stubborn or rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, that when they had chastened him, will not hearken unto him, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gates of his, of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, this, our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard, or drunkard. And all the men of his city 
shall stone him with a stone that he die so shall thou put evil away from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear now this is one of these texts that people point to as a reason not to listen to the Old Testament and the Bible they say this text here says how can you stone somebody for being a drunkard or a drunkard and a glutton but here we find that says the Bible saying this is what should be done and this was God's opinion of it but remember the Bible simply states that the wage of sin is what it's in his debt. And the Bible is saying, take serious that says a person that refused to work and just want to get up every day and be a drunk sooner or later will die. Now, even if you don't stone a person, in modern times, do people who are on drugs and alcohol for the most part die because of the drugs and alcohol? Yes, the end results are always death. So people say, oh, this is so terrible. Well, isn't the practice terrible? A person, after a while, they become so huge that they just basically have a heart attack and they die. That's why the Bible encourages that we practice these principles of not being gluttonous or drunkard. Our health will shine like the noonday. Another principle that we have here that's important is no tattoos or cutting of the skin. In Leviticus chapter 19 verse 28 it says, Ye shall not make any cutting in your flesh for the dead, nor print any mark upon you. I am the Lord. Very simple principle. The Bible is just simply stating that says, For health, and for treating your body as the temple of the Lord as being important, that you do not put crayon on yourself or paint on yourself, and you do not start to slice and dice yourself. It is not good. We know many cultures do this. Now, one of the reasons why I put this here, because I want to bring this idea out to you that people have a problem with the Old Testament because sometimes they don't have the connect of why would the Lord make a rule like that. Now, imagine the Lord created a body, and he created a body beautiful, and somebody says, what am I going to do with this body that is so beautiful, so excellent to look at? Right, the most beautiful thing in creation is the human being. I'm going to start to crayon it. I'm going to start to paint it up, paint it up. Just wrap paint all over on the body. I'm deface the beauty of the body. Now, uh, we could understand that the Lord himself who made the body and thinking it is good as I made it, even though affected by sin, I don't want you to do that. Would we understand why God would say don't do it? Again, if you have this room and you painted this room, myself and and Elder Jose painted this room. Um, he did more painting than me. You think you'll be happy if you just start to put crayon on it? And just mark it up? You'll be, you'll be mad. So people always say in the Old Testament that God has some rules and he's, he's very exact about the rules and he gets upset when people break the rules. But we could understand he's the one that made the body. And if he wanted to put crayon on the body, he could have put it on the body. But he made it without crayons because we know God is a lover of beauty and he created the flowers with a lot of colors. He created the animals with a lot of colors, but he don't create us with a lot of markings on our system, on our body. And we see in certain tribes, like in Africa, so they'll cut themselves in their face, cut themselves in their head as tribal markings. So this was a practice then, when the Lord was instructing Moses, said, tell him not to do that. This is what the society around you practice, but I don't want my people to practice that. So imagine you come to Israel, and you see people with not all, all, all these type of paint on themselves or crayons on themselves, and you don't see them with all kind of cuts on themselves. They will look different. And God always says, the reason why you're different is because you practice different principles that are not only healthier, but they're more beautiful. And they will look different, and they will be of different. And so all these health principles we're talking about, before we go to our last principle, is um, they're there to bless those who follow the Bible. Because since not one jot or tittle of the Bible shall pass away by no means, if we practice them, we'll find that our bodies will be healthier, our bodies will look cleaner, and we'll be looking happier and healthier, and our minds will be happier and healthier. So we talk about the last principles to close. The sanitary disposal of bodily waste. Now this, te this text is important because remember in the dark ages they had chained all the Bibles to the monastery walls, literally. They have gotten rid of all the Bibles. So most of they wouldn't know what was in the Bible. And like today, we're going back to all these drug resistant diseases that are coming from a lot of time unsanitary conditions. Think about it, we're going back to the dark ages. And why is that? Because people have thrown away the Bible. Now, one of the principles of the Bible is that you have to dispose properly of waste, both bodily waste and also waste in general. So in the Dark Ages, you had the bubonic plague that went on for centuries and centuries and centuries, and they could not get rid of it. And why? Because they did not have any proper disposal of waste. They would throw the waste anywhere. And any country you find, like places like India, where everybody just go and defecate anywhere, you find that there's high amount of diseases and high amount of flies and everything like that because of unsanitary condition. So we could understand again why God would tell Israel, I don't want you to be having defecation everywhere. 
I don't want it to have waste everywhere. I need the waste to be properly disposed of. People say, oh no, we need to have freedom. If you could free to do whatever you want to do. How dare the Lord tell us not to, you know, urinate everywhere. Well, nobody wants to live in those type of unsanitary condition. But yet we find the Bible says this, and people say, oh, the Bible is so terrible because you have all these health principles that are so restrictive. But again, is it restrictive if you're healthy? Again, it depends on your mindset. If you feel like so you need to defecate in the bed that you sleep in, that's your business. But the lawyer will say, don't do that. I don't think you should lay in feces. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter um, 23, verse 12 through 14, it says, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whether thou shalt go forth abroad. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give, thee, um, to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be hollow or holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. So here the Lord is saying that simply the principles of health that many people say are restrictive, each and every one of them are for our positive good. Every single health principle. And when you follow these health principles, you find that you'll be healthier. Your surroundings will be clean. Because we know the, Bible, we know the principles in the Bible, this principle that people always say, cleanliness is next to godliness. When we read the Old Testament, we find the Lord was very peculiar about the cleanness of his people. The clothes are supposed to be washed. Their homes are supposed to be clean. Everything is supposed to be clean. Because cleanliness is always next to godliness. Our bodies are supposed to be taken care of in the best condition. And so there's no health principle that the Bible put forth that is not for a positive good. It is only because people want to hurt themselves with drugs and alcohol and eating anything and, and sleeping with anything that we find so much disease and death. Because simply the Bible says the curse come not causeless. There's, no reason, there's always a reason why the curse is upon the land. And so we look at all these health principles that are thousands of years old, and we come to the simple conclusion that these health principles are what we call the evidence for faith. They are the simply evidence for faith. And the one health principle I didn't touch on is the health principle of quarantine, that you always have to quarantine when there's an outbreak of disease. All of these principles are in the Old Testament, and much more that we didn't touch on. And we want to follow them. And when we follow them, we realize, I say, really, there's something to this Bible that is very unique, that deals with all the problems of humanity and blesses us. I thank you again for listening, and thanks again for coming out. And I'll turn back over to our elder. Thank you. At this time, Sister Tamara Grubb will lead out in a song. Our closing hymn will be number 327. Number 327. Our closing hymn, 327. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than of riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world Today, I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to.
to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweet. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain or be I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Let us pray to close. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for giving us a natural solution to all the diseases and sickness that are going on in this earth. We know, dear Heavenly Father, that these diseases and sickness have been happening for a long time. But now it seems that it's coming to a plateau, dear Lord. But it's not. It's going to get worse. Dear Heavenly Father, we have uh, seen children dying before the parents as to when before the parents used to die first and then the children. We have a whole generation of children that are sick, dear Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, let us practice these principles so our bodies will be healthy and strong and prove to the world that your method is better than the medical system of this earth. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue to advance, dear Lord, in, in your word, let us also advance in the natural remedies that you have provided for us, which is a plant-based diet. And also, let us follow the other laws, dear Heavenly Father. At this time, dear Lord, let us keep in mind that as we continue on health and spreading the health message, let us also remember that the health message is not as important when you put in gospel. Let us also remember that the health of the soul is important too. Dear Lord, at this time, we ask blessings to all those who hear this presentation. And as they continue uh, their spiritual growth, let them be also um, great in health. At this time, dear Lord, I ask traveling mercies to all of us going back home, and I pray that all may yield to that word. In Christ I pray. Amen.